This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know. This week, really interesting guest, another young person, kind of a theme recently. Josh Hoffman is the founder of Izzy, which is a streaming service featuring really cool content coming out of Israel, kind of like a Netflix of Israeli content. Really, really interesting young man, made Aliyah after going on a birthright trip and has actualized his dream and is bringing it to the masses. So looking forward to speaking with him today. As always, please follow us on social media at Jews You Should Know, spelled out fully on Instagram and Facebook. Jews You Should Know with the letter U on Twitter. Subscribe wherever you're listening, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, whatever it might be. Please let your friends know about this show as well and have them subscribe. Comments, questions, suggestions to Jews You Should Know at gmail.com. And now to our conversation with Izzy founder, Josh Hoffman. We are here with Josh Hoffman, the co-founder of Izzy, which is a really, really cool streaming platform, bringing the power and magic of the land of Israel to the masses. Uh, How are you, Josh? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And as we do with all of our guests, Got to take it from the top. You seem like uh, on the younger end of some of our guests, so there might not be as many decades of background uh, there before your current venture, but uh, give us the history of whatever whatever decades were there. Where, where are you from? And uh, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Absolutely. So born and raised in Los Angeles uh, to a reformed Jewish upbringing. Uh, had a bar mitzvah, you know, went to public school and Jewish uh, Jewish uh, school on the side. Um, when I was 18, I wanted to be a sports broadcaster, so I went and studied journalism at San Diego State University. Did that for about five years. Uh, had really some awesome opportunities working for ESPN, NBC, Los Angeles Daily News, uh, but really understood in 2012 that the rules of the game in journalism and media were changing. I didn't know exactly where they were going, but I just felt that it was time to move away from sort of traditional media. And at that point, I sort of self-taught my, I taught myself uh, marketing, social media marketing, digital marketing, and started a consulting business. Uh, that was in summer 2012 uh, at the age of 23. Um, and then six months later, I went on a trip called Birthright, Teglit Birthright Israel. First time in Israel, you know, like I said, I grew up in a Jewish uh, home and everything, but we didn't really talk a lot about Israel. And even in uh, Jewish school, we didn't talk a lot about Israel other than things like the fact that it's the size of New Jersey uh, and, and maybe a few other things, but nothing really that, you know, pulled me uh, in wanting to know more about Israel or anything like that. I only went on birthright because it was a free trip. And my mom for five years was telling me, you'd be an idiot if you don't take advantage of this free trip. So I finally I did. And uh, literally in a, in a matter of days, I, you know, I'll never forget, I call my mom on the bus, you know, mom, this trip that you've been telling me to go on for five years, I love it so much, I'm not coming home. And I didn't go home. I stayed in Israel, I found some family that I had no idea existed, some cousins of cousins, stayed with them for about six weeks, found an apartment in Tel Aviv, and as they say, the rest is history. Unbelievable. So a lot there to unpack. So let's, let's rewind just a little bit. Growing up, you said in L.A., uh, which which part of L.A.? Yeah, in the San Fernando Valley. You're in the Valley. Okay, the Valley. I don't, a lot of people might not call that L.A., just for the record. but Correct, <laughs> correct. If you're from Pico or uh, something like that, you might be like, that's that's not L.A. But yeah. you grew up in the Valley, and you said you kind of had this reformed Jewish upbringing. High holidays, kind of a couple times a year sort of thing? Yeah, you know, Passover, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. You know, my dad fasted, my mom didn't. Um, you know, Hanukkah, um, I think we did Sukkot like one year through our temple. I remember the, the Purim, uh, parade slash festival that they had of our temple, but yeah, sort of the, the basics, if you want to call it that, nothing too crazy. Yeah. And 
you um, are your parents from Los Angeles? Are you been there for generations or I know it's a lot yeah. of transplants. Yeah. So my mom was born in LA. My dad was actually born in Frankfurt, but when he was one years old, they moved to LA. And so uh, more or less, yeah, both from LA. Very cool. Now, obviously LA is, is of course the center of the, uh, the media and the business or certainly the film industry and production and all that kind of stuff. Was that a part of your life growing up? Were you interested in that? Did you have a lot of friends with, you know, their, their parents were in the business as they say, that sort of Correct. thing. Yeah, you know, not so much. I mean, the thing that attracted me to journalism and, and media was storytelling. And, and obviously, you have a lot of different types of storytelling. You have, you know, journalism, reporting, and human interest content. You have, obviously, uh, movies, TV shows, documentaries. Um, the, the, the notion of storytelling was really what got me started. Uh, I love sports. So to me, it was sort of a, a natural synergy. I still do love sports. What are your teams? I really... Lakers, Dodgers, uh, you know, basically those two. And and do grow up with an NFL team? Now we have two in LA. But when I two. was a kid, we had none. So I don't, I don't really have any affinity for the NFL teams. Any Clippers but, yeah. nowadays, or or you can't do, you can't get on board with the Clippers? I can get on board with the fact, you know, I'm a I'm a student of the game. I also coach basketball for fun, so cool. I can get on board with the fact that they're a good team with a good coach and a good owner. But in terms of you know a true affinity and fandom, it's always been the Lakers. What are you thinking about? By the time this drops, we may be after the play. I don't know if we'll be after the playoffs or not. But uh, so now I can we can hold you to it. What do you, what do you think is going to happen in this little bubble tournament? I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. The, the, you know, like like I said, with with the media, the rules of the game have changed. Also, with sort of the coronavirus and the implications of how now it's changing. You know, the sports landscape. I think the rules are also changing. Dude, Josh, you played it safe, man. You played it safe. I know. I mean, listen, I'm rooting for the Lakers, and I want the Lakers to win, but. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see. It's, it's impossible to understand what, what's going to happen. And, you know, not playing without fans, I yeah. think, was definitely af affect certain players. It, it's going to be different, to say the least. And so, you know, yeah, uh, you look at that and you just sort of, you have no idea. You know, these are completely different circumstances. Yeah. Anyway, I interrupted you. said you're a big sports fan and you grew up kind of around the sports sitch and, and, uh, your, and p parents of your friends and things like that in the business or... Yeah, I mean, not so much in the business, just again, going back to storytelling, going back ah. to just being naturally curious about new information, new things, new people, new ideas. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's always been the constant, even when I went into marketing and was consulting businesses from local businesses to big brands, you know, it was always about how do you tell the story of that brand to the customer? Um, and, and now with Izzy, it's, you know, how do you tell the story of Israel in a long form entertainment way? So storytelling has absolutely been the common thread for me. And I think will continue to be. It's, it's something that transcends and uh, transcends uh, technology, transcends decades, transcends industries. It's, it's very, it's a very human thing. Yeah. So now you were uh, in college at where you said San Diego State? Correct. With Aztecs? That's right. There we go. But that was pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you were, you were, it sounds like not super involved in the Jewish community over there, right? So it's interesting. Um, San Diego State does have the Jewish fraternity, but, you know, I was not involved in any of the fraternity stuff in general. Um, and yeah, I really started to disconnect completely from my Jewish identity. I don't think I ever really had like a terribly strong Jewish identity, yeah. but definitely in college, as you know, you're, you're, you know, it's the first time where you're sort of out on your own and you're exploring and you're meeting new people and you're, you know, you're trying out different is, brands, of different brands of orange juice. I got you. Exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I really disconnected because, um, you know, I was just exploring a lot and it was a very sort of, um, you know, exploratory d discovery type of, you know, time in my life. And, very much disconnecting from Judaism. I used to fight with my family. I remember going back for, you know, birthdays or holidays and I used to tell them, you know, I'm not Jewish. It doesn't matter that I was born Jewish. It doesn't matter that I had a bar mitzvah, blah, blah, blah. And that's the craziest part of the story is that I go on birthright, really sort of being anti-Judaism, anti-Jewish, but also more just anti-religion of which I thought Judaism fell under that. And I get to Israel and that was some of the, the the, the biggest surprising elements for me was for the first time seeing a full-fledged Jewish society and seeing it operate. And when it was going to, you know, uh, a bar and literally everyone there is Jewish, including the bartenders and the waitresses and the bouncer, or just sort of experiencing this Jewish society 
to me, that flipped it on its head for me. And instantly I became extremely proud culturally, uh, religiously, spiritually, you know, however you want to cut it in being Jewish and then also wanting to now live here and, and take part in this Jewish society and get to know it a lot more. Uh, it was really a, as big of a turnaround as you're going to see. Yeah, uh, it's a pretty, one, it's pretty dramatic swing. To the, yeah, yeah, from one extreme to the other. When did you, you said you went on birthright in 2012? 2013. 2013. And, and which uh, provider did you go with? I went with Amazing Israel. Amazing Israel. Nice. And it was kind of random. You just sort of just signed up online with a random group. Yeah, it's funny. I signed up with my two best friends from Los Angeles and 10 days before they both bailed. No way. And, uh, you know, I'm not one to, you know, bail as well just because they bailed. I, I obviously still went and, you know, it was just, yeah, we, we didn't, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't anything specifically about Amazing Israel that I think attracted right. us. I mean, you know, there's, now they have all these niche trips and, and I think it's really cool because that's sort of what I think the, the modern day participants want. But back then there was only a few niche trips and it was more that general 10 day trip. I think we just, you know, randomly picked one. It was, I think it was more based on dates than it was the provider. And it just ended up being amazing Israel, which by the way is great. And, and yeah. I did become friendly with a lot of the people that work there and really changed my life. Unbelievable. All right. So take me to that Israel trip, that birthright trip. Was there a moment, uh, how many days in did, did it take for you to kind of, get the bug and there was there can you can you envision a particular place or or scene if you talk about storytelling that you're like oh my god i got this i got this judaism thing or this israel thing all wrong like i'm i'm in yeah i mean again i go back to that moment of calling my mom you know i remember standing up in the aisle on the bus you know you, you take these sort of big uh by the way, I've run about 15, 15 birthright trips myself through my work on campus. So I'm, I'm well aware you're, you're speaking, preaching to the choir. Right. So, so that's the moment I always remember. Uh, my mom wasn't terribly pleased. Um, my dad asked me two questions. He said, number one, do you have enough money? I said, yes. He said, number two, who's the girl? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that, that was the moment. And I think it was like day five or six of the trip um, where I really started to understand that you know because i had an online business my marketing business was all internet based and so i knew that i could continue it from here um and you know there's just a lot of things that made sense for me and it was more intuitive too it, i didn't i didn't have to think too much about it it just felt right and so you know one of the things that i've learned since since moving here is that you know my personality actually very much uh, correlates to the sort of Israeli culture and, and certain societal norms here. Um, one of those things is, you know, you don't, you jump in and then you figure it out. And that's what I did. You know what I mean? Like I, I didn't know how I was going to, you know, build a life here. Um, I, I did whatever research I could do. I spoke to as many people as I could speak to both on my birthright trip and, and after. Um, but it was a lot of just, this feels right. Let's do it. And then figure it out along the way. And to me, you know, I wouldn't have changed it looking back. It's pro those, those two friends of yours who bailed are probably, you know, like that guy, we didn't go, man. We'd be <laughs> yeah. No. So it's funny. I mean, only, they say only 2% of birthright participants actually make all the, uh, yeah. uh, number one and number two, I was the only one of the 40 participants on my trip that, that moved here and made all the, so it's definitely not common. Yeah, uh, I don't think it's birthright's goal uh, or agenda. I think it's simply to bring people here and then to send them, send them back to their countries as sort of unofficial ambassadors. Um, but yeah, you know, for me, it's just sort of a perfect storm. I was, I was also looking for, uh, you know, my whole life was in Southern California, which is not a bad place to, to have a whole life, yeah? But, you know, for the first 23 years of my life, it was LA and then San Diego and then back to LA. And so I was looking at San Francisco. I was looking at New York. I was looking at, you know, other places where I really wanted to expand my horizons after I graduated from San Diego State. I just didn't really know Tel Aviv existed. I mean, other than the name, but I didn't know what was going on here. I didn't know the vibe, the culture, the people, the lifestyle. And so when I got a taste of it on birthright, and then after, to me, Tel Aviv was the place I never knew really about, but I always wanted. And it just, you know, putting a square into a, a square peg type of thing. So, so tell me a little bit about um, you, you, you're sort of your autopsy of or dissection of analysis of the media you said you were you were starting you know at a journalism degree and i guess you were planning to go into you know traditional journalism and then you kind of pivoted to what we call new media new journalism something a little different 
uh, more narrative, more maybe subjective, kind of you know perspective journalism. What what did you see that was going on in the landscape? What did, what was your diagnosis and, and what was your solution early on before you? You know, before you kind of branched out, and did you go straight from college into these different big media companies? Like, yes. what was your journey there? Yeah. Well, I knew in college that there was a convergence, meaning traditional J school journalism schools, you do radio, you do TV, you do newspaper, and then you like, that's what you do. Uh, so I knew there was a convergence where I looked at ESPN and I saw, okay, the guy has a radio show, then he's on sports center that night, then he's writing for ESPN.com the next day. And so you have to be able to do all those things. So that was very clear to me. Um, I didn't know that we're going into where we are today, which is everything has to be entertainment. Straight news is a commodity and it's not something that people want to spend a lot of time or money uh, reading and consuming or watching. So there, ha- and, and, and let's, you know, let's look at the extreme of this. Fox News. I'm personally not a fan of Fox News. Fox News has been on record saying we're not a journalism entity. We are an entertainment platform that talks about current events and different things uh, of that nature. And while I don't necessarily agree with certain things that they may do or say, I can absolutely see the business vitality that's involved with entertaining people through, in their case, news and current events. And at least they're um, honest about it. <laughs> right. And then there's nothing wrong with that. Right. You know what I mean? And so they're, they're not investigative journalism. They're not 60 minutes. They're not, you know, um, you know, just cold, hard news. They are all about entertainment. And, and it, obviously it works for them. I mean, you know, whether you agree with their politics or not is a whole different story, but it, that works. And so today it's all about entertainment. No matter if you're doing news, sports, you know, lifestyle, culture, you have to entertain the audience. Um, and that's where the real value is. What does that tell you just maybe philosophically about, about where the world is today and where, where, where our generation is? Does that, does that like depress you in a certain way that like people can't just absorb information? They've got to be no, entertained? No, I don't think about that. I don't look at it that way. I mean, that, that might be true. Um, I, I don't look at it that way. I look at it that entertainment's been vital since the days of the radio where people used to huddle around and things like that and then obviously tv newspaper magazines were all entertainment more or less i just think that the the offer of entertainment now on the internet or digitally has caught up Um, the internet went through sort of uh, an evolution where it started with just straight information um, and then it went into like social media so then there was that like social component and now sort of the the current modern day internet is all about entertainment. Even if you look at Facebook, if you look at, you know, Amazon, Apple, they're all trying to grab that, that big entertainment opportunity in different ways. Sometimes it's long form content. Sometimes it's short form, you know, Amazon with audible and audiobooks. I mean, there's just so many versions of entertainment that existed before just largely existed in non-internet, non-digital ways. Now they're all going digital and it's, it's great because it's on demand. It's never been cheaper. It's never been more accessible. And also if you know how to play in this sort of new landscape of digital entertainment, you can do a lot of great things, both financially and otherwise. Tell me a little bit about uh, where you worked when it comes to big media and and what some of those experiences were right after college, you went to which company? So I was doing ESPN while I was in college. Okay. And then what were you doing at ESPN? Reporting, mainly reporting, doing packages and stuff. For like local that. local affiliate or it was for their uh, ESPNU. I don't even know if it's still around. I'm sure it yeah. is, but their college campus uh, channel. Uh, and then I went to NBC in San Diego, working for the TV affiliate there. Uh, and that was actually news. That wasn't sports. And I was doing uh, producing, writing, and, and and different things like that. Um, and it was it was very corporate at both sides. It was very stay in your lane. Um, it was very. Um, you know, this is your job and only your job and you have to sort of wait in line behind everyone else, um, you know, who, uh, was here before you or has more experience or whatever. And it just felt very old school and very, not, not something that I certainly aligned with on a company culture level, on a sort of business level, looking at, again, like the convergence of media and entertainment and all this stuff that we've been talking about just something didn't feel right. And and so I listened to myself and and I ultimately left because of that feeling. 
Interesting. Did you have access when you when you went to these places? Did you get to really sort of intern for or apprentice by any of these any of the great media talents at the ESPN or NBC? Yeah, I mean that's the other thing. It's a good, it's a good question, and, and and maybe this is my experience. You know, I don't I don't want people to think that what I'm saying is like an industry wide thing. It's a massive industry, but I, I felt that the older folks, uh, the more experienced folks, were not so eager to help the younger folks like me. And I tried. I really tried. Um, I, again, maybe it's those folks specifically. Um, you know, I can't really say, but like you reached um, out to some of the major national personalities and said, Hey, um, yeah, I mean, both, in- both one, I reached out via the internet because you know, the internet today, you can basically, you know, also back then you had Twitter and you had all, all types of stuff. Um, but also at the places I worked and, and I had face-to-face interactions and opportunities, but again, it, it, I just never really felt that they were into it. Maybe they were too busy. Maybe, you know, there's a million reasons why it didn't happen. Um, but that's what it was. Interesting. What did you learn from those environments besides, um, you know, besides what you learned not to do or what you wanted to, you kind of learned where you want to go um, on your own, but you must have taken away certain skills or certain abilities from these major corporations. Yeah. I mean, you know, there is benefit to working at a company like that. Um, you know, I think that, um, I, I think I learned more than anything how to sell myself because I didn't really have to intern. I sort of skipped that step and I went into the entry level jobs, um, which was really cool. And I think that's probably the biggest thing is it wasn't so much what I learned on the job is I learned how to get those jobs. How do I forego um, in that case, sort of the internships and actually go in into a, first of all, paid environment. And then also you get some more responsibilities when you, you know, are on the payroll, so to speak. And so, I think just knowing how to sell myself, knowing how to separate myself from the pack, from other people that wanted those jobs that I was able to get, that's probably the biggest thing that I look back and say I learned. In college, you were covering mostly, you were doing the, the sports thing for San Diego State. That's what that you were kind of covering there. Um, their sports programs? Yeah, I, mean, I was doing a lot of, I was doing a lot of uh, college sports in San Diego in general, including but not limited to San Diego State. And I was doing other stuff. I did some stuff for UCLA basketball and football. And, um, but yeah, it was a lot centered around college sports in general. Very cool. Did you get to meet any really cool uh, personalities during that time? I mean, I got to meet, you know, and, and, and work a little bit with Kawhi Leonard because he was a student at San Diego State when I was a student. Uh, Tony Gwynn was the baseball coach. He actually oh, wow. was really, really nice. He, pa- to me. he really passed did. away. Since then, yeah, right? he passed away, but he was the baseball coach at the time. Um, yeah, and I got to meet a bunch of random people. I got to, uh, eventually I went and worked for the Angels, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, their radio station in Anaheim. So I was going to Lakers and Clipper games and Dodger games as part of the media at the age of 20. So I got to interview Kobe, Dwight Howard, LeBron, Vince Carter, Matt Kemp. Uh, down the list so yeah I mean there was a lot of cool opportunities but you know that stuff wears off and and it becomes about the work and it becomes about the future and what you want for yourself how you want to grow Um, and and you know it's it's, you don't really after a certain period of time in sports media you you stop being a fan and it becomes a job now the question is is that job something that is putting you on the path that you envision and that you want to be on today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. And you know, the more that I thought about it, I just didn't feel like that's what I wanted to do long-term. Interesting. So now you're here in Israel, obviously at this birthright trip, you decide I'm not going back, which is a pretty dramatic move. Um, But I love it all in man, all in. Um, So you had this consulting company, I guess already. Right. So what was that? What were you doing with that? And, and kind of where did you want to take it? Yeah. So, you know, I was effectively helping small businesses and eventually some pretty big brands and nonprofits. Birthright became one of my clients and Nefesh Benefesh, a lot of different organizations in Israel. But I was actually mainly working with clients outside of Israel. So a lot of U.S. clients, some Europe. I had a client in China. Um, And yeah, just basically teaching them how to, to use the Internet social media, email marketing, you know, SEO to grow their business uh, in different ways or grow their organizational goals in different ways. Um, And what I learned basically when I moved to Israel is that wait, okay, everything's on the internet today. You know, it's email, it's Skype, it's, it's uh, social media and all this kind of stuff. So I can actually, you know, effectively work from anywhere. 
uh, obviously time zones do play a small part, but by and large, I wasn't doing anything terribly urgent. So, you know, if, if I got an email, I could let it sit in my inbox for six to eight hours while I may be sleeping uh, or whatever. Um, and I learned that, you know, how to be what they call a digital nomad. Uh, and so I was actually able to travel a lot. I started traveling in Europe, which I hadn't done prior to that because Europe's obviously extremely close to Israel. Then I went over to Southeast Asia. Um, and so it was a real really Israeli. Really. <laughs> yeah, it was just, you know, a, a really my 20s was really a time of exploration of you know, travel, of exploring Israel as well and the culture and the people and the history that, again, I didn't really know a whole lot about. Um, and just also learning a lot about how to run Internet businesses, about, um, you know, really what I want to do long term. I think I reached a point probably around 2017, 2018, where I started to realize I'm making good money. I'm able to travel and work from anywhere. I get to live in the best city in the world, which is, in my opinion, Tel Aviv. Um, and, and life's good, but I started to ask myself if I just wanted to, you know, help businesses make more money, especially businesses that I didn't care a whole lot about, you know, it was really just a, I'm a service provider. I'm a good service provider, but I'm a service provider. You're a business. To me, there wasn't a lot of depth. There wasn't a lot of passion. There wasn't a lot of meaning. And so I started to ask myself, okay, what's that next step that I can take that still allows me to you know do well financially still allows me to grow in different ways but also allows me to sort of fill the void that I started to have which is meaning purpose value to my world to the world in general and um, that's when you know I think a good segue in general is uh you know how I started to develop the concept for Izzy. Nice so even though you were even though you were servicing some really great nonprofits like Birthright and Nevesh Benefesh, you still felt there was that void. Yeah. I mean, you know, the bigger the client, uh, I also was working with, um, you know, a really big organization in China. I was working with Fendi, which is, you know, one of the big luxury fashion brands, the bigger the client, the actual harder it is to create that impact and that, that change for a lack of a better way of putting it, that you may want to have through a client. Um, so that there was some, some uh, frustrations there. And again, these clients are paying you a lot of money, but you also realize that just because you're making a lot of money or being paid a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean it's checking other boxes. Yeah. So what did you decide to then do? Had you kind of move into this, this world of Izzy, so to speak? And, and uh, did you have like a, an epiphany one day and, hey, I want to start representing Israel and doing that for my career? Like what happened? Yeah, there was no epiphany. There's no light bulb moment, but there was a lot of slowly paying attention to existing media companies from Israel pointed toward international global audiences. Uh, you know, you had I-24 News, which was pretty new when I moved here. Um, you have now what's called ILTV. You have the Times of Israel. You have some of the more institutional uh, media companies like Haaretz and J-Post. J-Post, yeah. Um, and, and really just sort of surveying that landscape, um, looking at what was working, what was, wasn't from the outside looking in, you know, I didn't have any sort of backstage access to any of these companies necessarily. Um, and, and just also paying attention to, again, like modern day media trends. Um, and yeah, one thing led to a next and, you know, streaming, I am very, uh, I, I very much believe streaming is just the next iteration of TV. So Today you have a thousand channels on TV. The average cable bill in America is a hundred dollars a month. Uh, that won't change. You'll still have a hundred, if not a thousand, if not more channels, and you might still be paying a hundred dollars, but you're going to be doing it in a way where it's a lot more a la carte. You know, you're going to do Disney Plus, you're going to do Netflix, and you're going to do Hulu, and you're going to do Izzy, and you're going to do National Geographic. I like how you slipped that in there. And, that was good. <laughs> exactly. And. Um, and you're going to be able to start and stop the account anytime, no long-term contracts, no hardware. So you don't have to worry about cable boxes. Um, you know, everything's going to be very streamlined. Uh, you don't have to worry about technicians coming out to your house, lining cables. Um, and, and that's really where we're going. And so uh, then also, you know, figuring out, okay, what's missing in the Israel international media landscape puzzle, looking at a, a lack of entertainment. Again, it's a lot of news. It's a lot of current events and, and, and again, that's, that's 
not necessarily a bad thing, but also what do people want on the internet today? We know that they want entertainment. So how can you provide them that in a way that makes business sense, in a way that allows you to grow and provide for as many people as possible, uh, in, a, in a way that also, you know, as you know, there's so much talent in Israel, talent in front of the camera, talent behind the camera. So how do you, you know, connect those people with the outside world uh, and, and, and also ensure that they're compensated on international uh, terms and not local Israeli terms where it's a small market and it's a sort of a very doggy dog environment in many cases. Uh, and these are good people, you know, these are not the kind of people that are trying to, you know, nickel and dime you all the time. They're, they're good, creative, you know, nice people um, and, and have talent that can certainly compete on an international level. Um, and, and yeah, you just sort of put all these pieces together and, and here comes Izzy. Amazing. So describe exactly what the platform is and what you're actually doing. Yeah. I mean, the easiest way to think about it is the Netflix of Israel and Israeli content. So, you know, we look like Netflix, we act like Netflix will soon be available on all the platforms that you can get Netflix, Apple, Amazon, Android, Roku, et cetera. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's all great Israeli movies, TV shows, documentaries, everything's in English, uh, both with subtitles. And also we do have some spoken English content and we'll have more in the future. And, and yeah, it's really giving people around the world a front row seat to Israel through great entertainment. So you're basically aggregating content from Israeli producers and content creators and just creating the platform for them to the delivery mechanism basically for them. Correct. So right now we're licensing a lot of content that already exists. It's already been produced. Um, the future in the very near future is actually moving very quickly into original content. Which is what Netflix and, and, and Amazon have done. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's really the name of the game here. Uh, we, we know that. Uh, that's also what gets us most, most excited. It's, it's a way for us to differentiate. It's a way to bring uh, certain types of content that don't exist to the market, so to speak. Um, and, and also, again, just to give as many people uh, as many opportunities as possible across the line from producers and directors and writers and editors to actors and actresses and musicians and uh, entertainers to uh, just bringing great content that's not so much about Israel, but it's Israel in the background and great stories and characters and narratives in the foreground. And I think, you know, that's been uh, the challenge that I think Israel is, is not taking uh, is not doing a good, a, job, a good enough job of sort of tackling is Israel is just making everything about Israel. And I think we got to go a lot more micro in how we sort of portray Israel to the world, which is uh, to focus on the amazing stories, the people, stories and narratives from history, from modern day fiction, nonfiction, and focus on those micro things and put Israel in the background. So it's, it's sort of like what Friends did for New York City. You know, Friends was not made to necessarily promote New York City or anything, but the association that it made for people around the world builds New York City's brand, so to speak, in a very uh, subliminal but ultimately effective way. Yeah, use the, I was about to use the word subliminal. It seems like this is not the frontal Hasbara, like here's Israel, Israel's awesome, startup nation, check out this cool company do a little documentary on the company or something this is these are cool great shows that you would watch anyway exactly and by the way it's happening in israel it's produced by you know it's israeli actors whatever the background is you know you see the western wall in the background because that's what they're walking by anyway that kind of thing and then like oh israel's cool um which in a certain way is obviously more powerful because people don't feel like they're being propagandized. Um, they feel like they're just being entertained and, and the propaganda, so to speak, is by osmosis in a, in a, in a, in a different sort of way. Um, yeah. I have you know, a bunch of questions about this whole concept. I mean, first of all, how do you compete with somebody like Netflix? I mean, it, it's interesting because I think lately, uh, or in, in recent years, you've had this explosion of Israeli shows becoming super popular in you know the broader public consciousness so i mean you think of schtissel you think of fauda um i'm sure there's others um does that help you or does that hurt you because now a, a, a behemoth like netflix is is also going to be scouring the israeli landscape for the next schtissel for the next fauda and then that's going to be a lot harder for 
someone like you to be able to to compete? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it does not hurt us. Netflix does not hurt us. Uh, Netflix is a competitor, just like Facebook is a competitor, just like the movie theater is a competitor. We're all in now in the entertainment space competing for people's time and attention and a little bit of their money. Um, but you know, we don't. We 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 definitely know that by having what we'll call Israeli really content on mainstream platforms like Netflix, like Amazon, like Apple, um, that raises the profile of Israeli content, which has a very real impact on Izzy, and and we're aware of that. And ultimately, because we're a mission driven company, um, if you can get on Netflix, if you can get on some of these bigger platforms. We love that. We think on a personal level, that's great because you're going to reach more people. Um, it, it ultimately aligns with with our organizational goals and, and mission. Um, on the at the same token, because we are effectively the only streaming platform uh, focused on on Israel, Apple and Netflix and 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 all these other bigger platforms, they'll get the top one percent of the content that's coming out of here because we'll never be able to outbid them. But for every, you know, if you have a hundred productions and they get, let's say the top five, six to 100 after those top five are just as good as the top five, but will never make it to those bigger platforms. And so we really are the platform for those, you know, other, you know, 94 uh, uh, productions or whatever. Uh, and they'll be just as good as those top five. Um, and, and we know that uh, just because there's so much talent in this in this country not that there's not talent in other countries because it's a small country there really if you look at sort of the if we can call it the talent per capita is massively high here and so um you know we're excited to work with all types of filmmakers even if student films that are coming out of the, the 16 different film schools in israel uh that are really really impressive for student films you know obviously low budget and things of that nature so you know there's just so much talent here there's so much opportunity if you can get on Netflix, I couldn't be happier for you. And if you can't, come and work with us at Izzy. So how do you, obviously you mentioned it's a, it's a mission-driven organization, but it is a for-profit, right? So- 100%. And, and, and I think, you know, one of our things that we want to do is, you know, you can be a for-profit mission-driven company. They're not mutually exclusive. And if you look at uh, different companies that, uh, you know, you go back to, uh, you know, your question about sort of corporate America and NBC and ESPN, those companies are not mission driven. They have a mission statement, but they're not inherently within their day to day company culture mission driven. When you want to get top talent today, in addition to paying well and some of the other sort of basic benefits, we know that especially young people like myself, millennials, so to speak, they want to work for companies in which they believe are uh, doing things. Uh, in the world, in different sectors, in different parts um, that align with their values and, and what they want to be a part of and what they want to invest their time and energy into. And so we've seen that so many people are excited to work with us, whether it's you know people on the production side with filmmakers and stuff like that, whether it's you know different uh, internationals that either are living in Israel currently like myself or people that want to move here that you know want to get involved because we are truly a mission driven organization uh, that happens to be a for profit. And that's, we're very, very proud to be a for-profit because one of the biggest reasons why uh, Izzy hasn't existed up until now, now in Israel is because most of these media companies are not for-profit or if they are, they don't really turn a profit. And if you don't turn a profit, you're not challenged to grow. You're not challenged to innovate. You're not challenged to bring the best product to the market. And that's what we're all about. So how do you, uh, so you basically, you've raised money, I imagine, to from, from, have you gone to venture venture cap route or private investors? How have you uh, have you been able to get even just even? To, it seems like the barrier of entry is pretty high because if you want to buy quality content, that's expensive, and certainly if you want to start creating or producing original content, that's very expensive. And you know you need to have a uh, and it's kind of a chicken or egg sort of thing, isn't it? Because you need you need the subscription base to generate enough revenue to demonstrate that you're potentially viable to then attract the funds to get to the next level, to then get more subscribers. How do you, how do you deal with that whole cycle, which seems pretty kind of a difficult code to crack? Yeah. Yeah, of course. So, you know, up until now, we actually haven't raised money. We are now currently seeking seed investment uh, and, and talking pretty seriously to a variety of different investors. Um, 
you know, I was able to invest uh, a significant amount of money into the company to get us started, um, which was just based on the fact that, you know, I, I had the money, thankfully, and um, it, it made sense. I believed in it. it. There was never, you know, I think also it shows investors because there was a, we obviously always wanted to go and get investment down the line just to scale, but it also shows investors like, wow, all right, he invested all this money of his own money. Uh, he put his money where his mouth is, so to speak. So, you know, there was that. We also had a pre-order campaign from basically April 1st to May 20, 20th, I want to say. That generated some significant funds for us that we were able to use uh, to then launch the platform on May 21st as a web platform and then move very quickly into the apps that I mentioned, six different apps that will be available at the end of July. Um, and then from there, it's just a content game. Uh, so we already have paying subscribers. We had a nice pre-order uh, you know, sort of campaign. Um, and, and now it's just about finishing the technology and then continuing to bring epic content uh, movies, TV shows, documentaries, and some other stuff to our audiences and, and grow that. You know, we've had almost 7,000 people now sign up for the platform uh, in just under four weeks. So, um, you know, we know people are excited. We know that we have a few things to shore up, which is why we expedited the apps. That's been the biggest sort of complaint, if you will, or piece of feedback that people want to get us on the smart TV and Roku and some of these other places, which we were going to do anyway we just expedited a little bit uh, because that was the main piece of feedback after we launched um, but listen I mean uh, we have a business model so we can continue to grow organically even if we don't bring in the kind of investment that makes sense for us and I don't talk about money I talk about a, a partner in an investment because we are I think the only sort of media company in Israel going after international audiences that does not have a political government or religious affiliation. And we're extremely proud of that. We don't take sides. We don't try to show you only the good parts of Israel. We give you a front row seat to Israel. Israel has a lot of amazing things. Israel has some questionable things. Israel has a lot of interesting things, both good and not so good. And we're going to give you all that. And then you're going to decide whether you're Jewish, whether you're not Jewish, whether you're old, whether you're young, you're going to decide what you want to decide about Israel, the modern day Israel, and what's going on in Israel today, both the good and the not so good, the sexy and the not so sexy. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's something that we take very seriously and, and wanting to find that right partner is a big part of that on the investment side. Are you really geared towards American audiences? Gen English speaking in general, what's the, what's the focus demographically? Yeah, I mean, right now we're definitely going after English speaking audiences because it's an English platform. And even though we do have a lot of content, for example, in Hebrew, English subtitles and all that content. So you look at, of course, North America, UK, a few other countries in Europe. Australia has actually been pretty big for us as well. But we also know there's massive interest uh, in the Asian markets, particularly China and Japan. So definitely wanting to look at that you know, within the next 12 to 18 months, and also the Latin American Spanish speaking markets, massive interest in Israel for different reasons. So and that would just require you translating these things in different languages, correct, putting subtitles in different languages, much like you have on Netflix. And, uh, and we're prepared for that, because we know that uh, in order to go into those markets, you have to, you know, speak those languages. What is the name Izzy and, and who thought of it? Yeah, so the original name was actually Hello Israel, which is what I came up with, which admittedly was a pretty uh, average or even below average name. And then one yeah. of our advisors, a guy named Ari Yablak, who um, is one of the top branding people in Israel, originally from the United States as well. Um, you know, we talked about it and he's like, you need something a little short, a little bit more, you know, with a little, a little bit more of a punch. And I remember I was on a train. Uh, it was like a Wednesday night. I was on a train to Jerusalem for a concert and I get a text. And he says, what do you think about Izzy? Boom. <laughs> Done. First sight. Done. Changed it right away. And, uh, and yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a short for Israel essentially, but, uh, but yeah, we love it. And, and I think a lot of people do too. I like it. It's kind of like Izzy's almost like a nickname for someone named Israel. And so here it's kind of like, if you really want to get to know Israel, if you want to be kind of friends with Israel, you call him Izzy, you know, like you, you watch Izzy, you know, um, that's cool. Have you been approached already by content creators and things like that are people starting to pitch you do people want to get on this platform 
Um, oh, yeah. and, and what kinds of like interesting or different sorts of productions can you imagine besides, you know, I think most people can sort of think about tip traditional entertainment, traditional TV shows, things like that. But are there different, more creative things, maybe something on the Jewish, you know, kind of spiritual side or other kinds of things people might not be thinking about that actually are going to be featured? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, there's so much. I'm just pulling up here our original content productions that we've generated some of these ideas internally. And also, yeah, we're getting pitched now basically every day by different filmmakers, production companies in Israel. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just throw some ones out and, and we'll kind of see. Um, so I'll let you know which ones to, I'll agree to green light. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so, um, you know, one that just jumps out here, it's called She Said Yes, which is about uh, arranging unique marriage proposals in Israel as like a surprise. And just, you know, obviously telling the story of how they met. It could be, you know, uh, Olim Khadashim that, that moved to Israel. It could be local Israelis. That one could be pretty, pretty cute and cool. Um, Jerusalem Diaries is actually based on a book by Judy Ballant, um, looking at how recent history has shaped modern day Jerusalem uh, through the eyes of, you know, locals and people that have been living there like her. She, I think, originally is from Seattle and has been living in Jerusalem for something like the last 30 years. So that could be really cool. Um, Law, laws of the, of the Land is also going to be a cool series where it's about exploring the laws that are unique to the state of Israel. I'll give you one that's, I just learned this like a few weeks ago. So the, the law in Israel is that a pig in terms of uh, livestock cannot actually uh, touch the, the land of Israel. So you have to build these like mini platforms and that's where the, the pigs like, you know, do whatever they do. And the reason is because pigs are, is not kosher. So it's literally against the law to raise pigs on the actual land of Israel. You have to build these platforms and they can only <laughs> be on the platform. So that's an example of a law that is interesting, different, don't think it exists anywhere outside of Israel. Um, and, and that's cool as well. Um, so those are some of our TV shows and series. We're also thinking about doing, we had a pitch uh, to do uh, a similar, like the West Wing uh, on the Israeli, you know, Knesset, Knesset, which I think could be cool from like a drama standpoint. Um, we thought about the doing East, so, the East Wing, exactly, <laughs> um, or the Middle East Wing. <laughs> yeah, we thought about doing a, uh, a, a comedy series called the Ulpan, uh, which in, in Hebrew means uh, like the Hebrew school, where you have it's it's really just hilarious. You know, you have people like me moving to Israel, different, you know, you know, backgrounds, cultures. Uh, ages and sort of, you know, you're all pitted into this classroom. Many, many of us are basically adults. It's, so it's, it's, it's much different than, you know, having kids learning a language. And, and so there's a cool sort of comedy series that we can build around that in, in a scripted uh, sort of uh, a way. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of cool documentaries, um, you know, looking at, uh, for example, Yehuda Eder, which was one of the original rock stars in Israel, and now is the owner of Rimon, which is the top music school in Israel. Uh, also a sister school of the Berkeley School of Music. Huh. So he has a tremendously interesting story in terms of documentary. Um, legend Has It is, is exploring different uh, legends and mysteries in Israel in sort of a documentary series style. Um, Born to Ball, the Omri Caspi story. I'm sure you, you know Omri Caspi. Yeah. Um, and then looking at also, you know, movies. So just uh, throw some, some out there for you. Uh, so we want to do a biopic on Ben Gurion. Uh, that could be super interesting. Um, Love Thy Neighbor is about uh, basically a, a woman that grew up in a Lebanese woman in Lebanon that grew up hating Israel, and then her mother needed like life-saving treatment, so they actually came. Like Israel basically brought her to Israel, gave her the treatment, and it just sort of shows sort of that human side of Israel that I know a lot of people talk about in, in show, but it, you know to do it in sort of a feature film, I think could be really interesting. Um, there's a really good story about the, the city of Netanya and, and how Netanya got that name. It actually comes from Nathan Strauss, which is, uh, you know, the, one of the, the founders of Macy's and, and, uh, doing a feature film about the Titanic, that. Titanic story. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's just so much, I mean, there's two reasons why we created Izzy point blank one, so much opportunities to create movies, TV shows, documentaries here based on the culture, the, the history, the law, you know, the biblical history, the modern day history, uh, the society of Israel. There's just so much here 
that packs a really, really great punch on an entertainment level, and then the talent to actually make this content come to life. Again, producers, directors, you know, filmmakers, uh, writers, actors, you put those two things together, you're going to get some nice entertainment coming out of Izzy pretty soon. Amazing. I see you, you light up when you start talking about the different <laughs> opportunities, which is usually a good sign that you're in the right, you're in the right spot that you've kind of had that, that place of synergy and, and, uh, and creativity, which is awesome. Um, t- Josh, tell people where they can learn about this. How do they, you know, what, what do they do? The first steps I want to, I want to start watching this stuff. They go to a website, they go to an app. What do they do? Yeah. So right now go to www.helloisrael.tv. We didn't, we didn't change that yet. We didn't change that yet. (laughs) Uh, And then you put your email in, you'll get an invite from us. Then we'll send you all the credentials and things of that nature. Right now we're offering a seven day free trial. Uh, Start and stop your account anytime, just like any of the other uh, streaming platforms. And, and yeah, you know, we're, we're excited and we're always open to hearing people's feedback as well. So don't be a stranger. If you like or don't like certain things, please let us know. And uh, yeah. Amazing. Josh Hoffman from Izzy, formerly Hello Israel. And uh, great to say hello to you, Josh. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Amazing. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews You Should Know.